Summer Terry here, and we are at Superior Therapy, and I have Aaron Custer, which is the owner of Cool Speed Feed, here with me this evening. Um, we're going to kind of let this live fire up and, and let some people get on here. Um, we're actually a few minutes early, so whenever you get logged on and get to watching, um, let us know that you're here. And so tonight on this live, um, we want to cover kind of all things um, equine nutrition. So we're going to be just kind of going through your feed management, your feed balance, um, the nutritional needs of, of your different levels of performance horses. Uh, so basically, we're just going to kind of cover um, all all things therapy or all things therapy. That, that's that too. This, yeah. You can tell I've been doing a lot of my own lives. <laughs> We're going to cover all things nutrition, which actually does have a big factor on how well horses heal that are in rehab or in therapy or that have been injured. So actually, it all ties together because you've got to have complete nutrition to be able to have a healthy body. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about kind of general feeding management, uh, some things that we take for granted sometimes. Uh, I know I did uh, and have in the past. So uh, just to start with, obviously clean water. If your horse doesn't have good clean water, fresh water every day, they're not gonna wanna drink or not drink a lot. And a lot of times that's, that is a precursor to a, to a colic incident. So um, obviously clean water. Um, you know, the, the, the timing and uh, when you feed each one of your feedstuffs, basically a concentrate and, and hay, uh, and a concentrate, I'm talking about the, the feed blend uh, of your choice. So uh, always, always, always keep something in front of your horse for them to chew on, hay primarily not feed, but hay. So just think about it. Horses are forage-based animals. God made them to eat small meals all day long. And we as humans have modified that uh, to some extent uh, for our own convenience. Uh, and just sometimes it, it, we thought it was necessary, but I'm telling you, uh, a fiber mat in that horse's gut is very important uh, to their digestive process. It keeps that ingestion moving through the system. Uh, there again, you know, we, we've all fought colic at some point if we've been in the horse business very long. Uh, that is just a disruption uh, in the natural uh, flow of the in, the in the digestive tract. So not enough water not enough or the right type of hay or and the timing of, of feeding that hay uh, all play factors in that so um so to kind of go back to the water um how much water should a horse be drinking in a day on an average um, is it 10 degrees or 100 degrees <laughs> so, give, give us both scenarios uh, is it, if it's summertime uh, and it's winter time you um, know um, what would be an ideal amount I, I feel like that's one thing when your horse is stalled at least you do have a little better better system of measurement right. if you've got buckets in there versus a horse that can drink out of a pond or um, a horse that's drinking out of a stock tank. But you right. know, on an average, what should we be looking for? Uh, I'm gonna ask you, Summer. What do you see in your therapy barn in general? I mean, will a horse drink three five gallon buckets a day? Or uh... typically, we keep we keep two in the stalls and. Um, Typically, whenever we feel late of an evening in the summertime, um, actually, Tim will come down um, usually 10, 30, 11 at night and he refills again. Um, but most of the time, most of our horses will have both buckets empty in the morning. And then when we refill again, um, you know, in, in the winter, you may have one that you have to kind of top off before feeding time. But usually by feeding time, we're refilling those. All. So I, I would say maybe maybe four to five of those buckets a day it, it, on an average of just a an even temperature day and mm -hmm. probably six if it's hot it, is that 18, about 18 to 25 gallons a day 
uh, and it depends on if they're sweating, you know, there's right. some, some other factors there too, but, mm -hmm. but I guess it, I've never really worried too much about that number. It's, it's right. only that they are, have a, absolute fresh water in, at their disposal when they want to drink it. Okay. Uh, and especially if, if you've let them run out of water, then you feed them. They're dry, their mouth is dry, they try to eat feed. You're just asking for an issue. Uh, so there again, uh, it, I just can't stress the importance of, of good, clean, fresh water right. in front of them 24 seven period. Because isn't it the saliva that helps to to kind of get that feed to where it needs to go in the stomach so oh, yeah. it can start be, being digested. So yeah. if you've got a horse that's dehydrated and not had enough water and they have you know don't have that saliva, then they may not be breaking that feed down correctly. Well, they, they need to have some saliva, putting saliva with the feed uh, and or hay as they're eating. Uh, obviously, they've got to be hydrated to create uh, the, the saliva and the right amounts too. I mean, try to eat uh, a handful of popcorn without anything to drink or a bag full of popcorn without anything to drink or a soda cracker. Mm -hmm. uh, or like I, the old thing that they used to have you do in high school where you had to like eat the cracker and then whistle and yeah, you can't yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, yes, uh, same principle. Uh, but back to the saliva, I mean, that that is the first first uh, I guess, addition to a feedstuff that the horse puts in there to start the digestive process. And also saliva is very basic. So it, it's, it's mother nature's buffer and it does help uh, with some pH balance in the gut also. It's, it's not going to fix hundred percent of it, but right. it does help. I know so, like whenever we've had horses that have come in that have been you know, severely malnourished or underweight um, on those horses, I typically will wet their feed. Um, I, I don't mm -hmm. know if I do it because it makes me worry less <laughs> or if it really helps them, but, um, you know, I, I feel like, okay, just wetting that feed helps it kind of go on down a little bit because you don't know what you're dealing with yeah. when you get one that's severely underweight. Milk and cookies. Can't say <laughs> better. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's a little bit about the feeding management. Uh, one other thing, I, one point I do want to make is if there's any way possible that you can feed, make sure, or if their horse is out of hay by chance when you feeding times come, feed them some hay first before you feed them the feed. Uh, there again, you, you need that fiber mat in that gut when the concentrate hits it. So helps with pH balance. It just helps the digestive process. So, um, so whenever you're talking about that fiber mat coming from the hay, um, is that does that change depending on what kind of hay that you feed or what kind of forage that it is? You know, like you have the people that feed just like your native grass hay, and then you have people that feed all the way up to high-end alfalfa. Like what what's your difference in those forages and, and what do they provide for the horse? Uh, well, prairie grass, native grass hay uh, versus uh, good leafy alfalfa, those are the opposite ends of the spectrum. They both have a fraction of fiber, a fraction of protein, a fraction of, of, of energy. Uh, so if you if we start with the, the uh, prairie grass hay, you know, two pounds of prairie grass hay, if a horse eats that, is going to create more of a fiber mat than a highly digestible hay like uh, alfalfa. However, uh, for performance horses, I'm not a huge fan of, of prairie grass hay. Now, I will say this, you'll never hurt one, and they'll hardly ever, ever colic on it because it's very, very fibrous, passes through that digestive tract, and it's like, like us eating a bran muffin. Uh, that's pretty much what it is. So, uh, but it's, it's not very nutrient dense. Uh, but there again, it kind of depends on how people cut it too. So good. What, what about hay? like the Bermuda? Um, um, they, like or, or brome? Like what are what are some yeah. other types of hay that people might be feeding? Uh, in in order of digestibility and quality, in my, in my opinion, the the prairie grass is the lowest. Uh, you know, mature Bermuda is right up up from it. 
uh, good quality Bermuda that's cut right is, is actually a very good hay, very nutrient uh, dense or kind of in the mid range of the nutrient density. Uh, brome hay generally is very good unless it's cut really late and it's very mature. Um, then you get into your alfalfas. That's kind of the haze in our part of the country in, in the in the mid to southwest. Now I will say this, um, I'm seeing more Timothy Timothy alfalfa type hay uh, showing up in, in Oklahoma and Texas. It has to come from the north because we can't grow it down here. But uh, that is probably my favorite hay uh, to feed a horse as far as a, a alfalfa grass blend. It very highly digestible, very energy dense, very nutrient dense, uh, very consistent. But uh, that's why I'm a big fan of, of a Timothy or Timothy alfalfa blend uh, hay. Now, okay. uh, one hay in our country that, that will compete with it is um, crabgrass. But trouble with crabgrass is you just can't hardly find it. If you do find it, uh, it's very rare. I didn't even know that could be fed to horses. Oh, yeah. It's a great feed. It's a crab, crabgrass is very nutrient dense. It, I don't think it's kin to, to Timothy, but it's in kind of the same uh, class of, of hay as far as quality and nutrient value. Yeah, so I had no idea. Yeah, uh, crabgrass is a fantastic feed. Huh. Hey. And, and everybody that's watching, feel free to post questions. Um, whatever questions you have, whether it be, um, you know, on, on just general nutrition or the forage or the cool speed, Go ahead and start sending your questions in and when we kind of get to a, a, a hesitating point, then I'll read out some of the questions and we can answer along. Um, or, you know, if you've got input, type that in as well. We, we want this to be as interactive for y'all as the rest of our lives. So we want to make sure that we're answering all the questions that you have as well. Yes. Um, I have ran on to some issues and I, I'm sound like I'm belaboring the point on hay. But think about it, hay is at least two thirds, if not three quarters of what your horse eats. So it makes a huge difference on the type, quality and quantity that you feed. But uh, there are some hays out there that, although are nutrient dense, uh, they can cause some problems. And, the, and those are the, the wheat hays, especially a wheat hay that, that has been baled later on in the stage where the head is is pretty much formed. Uh, you're just asking for a starch overload uh, because just think about it. Wheat is is very very high in starch, and the horses love those heads. Mm -hmm. and, and so, just be aware uh, if you're going to feed wheat hay, it needs to be really really early cut before that head is formed. Uh, then it can be as good as alfalfa. Well, pretty close to as good as alfalfa love it but uh there is there is a there's a point where you don't want to feed wheat hay a point in this maturity uh, it depends on when it was cut but uh that's just one little word of warning I'd, I'd like to put out there right um so here's a question on soaked alfalfa pellets is this a good nutrient booster and should you always soak your alfalfa pellets everybody has a difference of opinion on that i'll tell you what mine is yes uh there again, I'll go back to the to the saltine cracker and water uh, analogy. Uh, alfalfa pellets are, are nutrient dense. Yes, uh, generally 15 to 17 percent protein, high fiber, uh, mid range protein, uh, and and they're a good supplement. I say supplement, not in the terms of a supplement you buy, but supplement to your feeding program. Uh, if you if you need to feed some alfalfa or feel like you need to and there's not a good source of alfalfa hay, then yes, sure, alfalfa pellets are just fine or alfalfa cubes. Now back to your question, uh, should you soak them? Uh, yes, I prefer that you soak them simply because there again, if you feed your horse and that horse has been without some hay and it's hungry, they're going to get a mouthful of those alfalfa pellets start trying to chew them up and I'm going to tell you it high likelihood they you will have a choke issue uh, or they'll have to cough them up uh, so I personally prefer that people soak their alfalfa pellets or put them in one of those uh, slow feeder uh, feed pans uh, 
-hmm. that you know they have to really just nibble and get get a few of them here and there and and really work at it but it gives them time to put some saliva with it but uh, i think soaking is a, is a great idea if you're feeding alfalfa pellets by themselves especially well and on average like what what is the ratio i mean i know it's going to differ per brand but I, I feel like there are a lot of people that that do a grain-free diet that that just do alfalfa pellets or alfalfa cubes mm -hmm. and i feel like one one of the withdrawals that you hear people talking about with that is the expense of it so you know if you're feeding just alfalfa hay um you know realistically how much pellets do you have to feed to be able to equal what your consistency is in the hay uh pound for pound I mean, honestly, that if you're feeding five pounds of alfalfa hay, five pounds of alfalfa pellets. I mean, that's that's a pretty good equivalent. Okay, so they're they're <coughs> kind of a, across the board. The, yeah, the the one point I will make about alfalfa pellets versus an alfalfa hay. <clears throat> alfalfa hay is a long stem forage. Talk, remember, I'm me talking about that fiber mat. Uh, that it's way more effective in that gut. Uh, as a fiber mat uh, and and more of a buffering action than what you get from alfalfa pellets because the alfalfa pellets they have to be fine ground or ground up very fine before they can be put into a pellet and it stay in a pellet so uh, and two you know hardeners uh, some things have to be put with the pellets to make them a good pellet and not just a crumbling mess so if there's a choice I prefer hay. If there's no choice, sure. Uh, I guess in my in in order of my preferences, it'd be hay one, uh, alfalfa cubes two, then alfalfa pellets. But they are a viable source uh, to uh, give you a little more protein and energy. So, so we've covered water, we've covered hay. Um, I guess now we're ready to move into feeds and uh, the importance sure. of feed <laughs> okay um just want to preface the feeds just a little bit with uh feeding programs uh and feeding management uh can either alleviate or cause you 90 percent of your digestive problems uh and when i say digestive issues uh, i'm primarily talking about colic and or ulcers. Uh, and sometimes ulcers can be uh, a, a causative agent for, for the colic too. But I'm gonna say at least 80% of the horses that are being competed on, uh, if they don't have a full blown ulcer, they've got the precursor, which is be like me and you having heartburn. Uh, their belly's on fire. So because with horses, like to kind of go back to, you know, how our horses are different than humans, their stomach acid is constantly pumping where yes. us as humans, if you don't have acid reflux or have digestive problems, um, as soon as we eat food and we start to chew, that stimulates our body to start the digestive process. So by the time our food hits our stomach, then our stomach starts pumping acid in there, which starts to break the food down. And then our acid production stops whenever there's not food to be digested, where because a horse is a forage based animal and they're kind of made to be able to eat all the time, their acid production doesn't stop. So that's where it's important to have your hay and things to give that acid something to do other than eat the lining of the stomach. Um, and then, of course, just like us, your stress, the more stressed you are, the more acid you're going to produce. And then that's where you start to run into problems. Well, it as Summer said, horses produce acid 24 mm seven. -hmm. And there again, God made them to be grazing animals, small meals all day long. I, I, I wanna beat that to death, but it, it's just the way it is. So a, a horse needs something in their belly all the time that to, to help, I mean, so they can utilize that acid. So you don't get your pH balance out of whack. And that's, that's essentially, what causes a lot of the, the digestive upset and ulcer issues in these horses is a, a, just a low pH, uh, an acidic state over time. And you heard me mention the, the, the fiber mat. If you have a fiber mat in that gut at all times, 
that stomach acid can't slosh up on, onto the margin between the top and the bottom part of the stomach. And I, pardon me, I can't remember what that's called, that line. But um, if you have that fiber mat in there, it, they're not, that acid can't slosh around and, and cause those lesions and, and that acidity and that burning. So um, I'll go on to the ne next part of this. But so with that being said, lots of hay, lots of water, feed the right feed. Um, there's lots of supplements on the market today. A lot of good supplements, they really are. Uh, very balanced, high quality, all that. But I can't tell you how many barns that I've walked into and their feed room looks like a Rexall store. <laughs> uh, I mean, they seriously have three or four or five different supplements that they're that they're putting a little of this little of that in and they're feeding what they think is a good feed and a lot of times it is i'm not knocking anybody's feed <clears throat> but you, you can get some antagonistic effects out of feeding too many supplements on top of a feed that is already nutritionally balanced and uh, when I say nutritionally balanced, I'm talking about binders, minerals, trace minerals, your cow phosphorus ratio, you know, things like that. So uh, then when you start adding those supplements that also have some of those same qualities in them, then you can almost get like an adverse reaction? Yes, you can. And I'll, I'll use one uh, nutrient as, as a, uh, an example, selenium. Uh, very uh, essential to a horse's health, but you can get over that that threshold and actually start causing issues. And there again, I can't tell you how many times I've went in and people say, well, here, here's the label. This is how much I'm feeding. You tell me, you know, what am I doing? And they've got their selenium way too high. So first thing I do is start pulling stuff out. You know, what do you have to have? Why are you feeding this? Why are you doing this versus that one? Or why are you mixing them? Um, I think that's a big thing is people a lot of times don't know why they're feeding what they're feeding. It's because, you know, one of their friends feeds it or uh, somebody they look up to in competition feeds this and they don't look at the whole program. They just go and they just buy. And, and then, like you said, you start compiling things together and then sometimes end up with a mess. Well, and that's exactly right. It, you and I'm just as bad as anybody. You, you only get half the story. And when somebody's talking, you say, wow, that's what my horse is doing. And they're feeding this supplement or that supplement or this feed or that feed. Say, well, I got to try that. Well, if you do that, you got to take something else away uh, so you don't get that that overlapping uh, stacking on top of, uh, right. of the nutrients. So <clears throat> number one, it's very expensive to do that. And no number two, you may be uh, causing as many issues as, as you're trying to solve. So uh, don't want to mean that sound like I'm knocking supplements. It's no why you're feeding what you're feeding. It's not saying yeah, that, exactly. it's, that there's exactly that it's an inappropriate thing to feed. It's what is your why? Yes, exactly. And, and that's that's just a big uh, that's one of my pet peeves is, is to walk in and see a little of this and a little of that, and you know buckets, you know this much for this horse feeding five horses and every one of them's a different recipe that's to me that's a recipe for a problem right so um well and that brings me to another question that that we had written down and then we'll get to some of the questions that are over here so just keep keep typing your questions in because we're going to circle back and get to them but um how to read a feed tag you know that that's uh, i think another thing too is it's just like you know you go to the grocery store and you're shopping for yourself like we can read the ingredients that are on the back, but how mm -hmm. do we really know what we need or what's important? Right. <clears throat> Some states require that you list the feed ingredients by name. Other states just require that you list feed ingredients uh, as a collective term. Um, Oklahoma requires that you, you list it as a collective term. Um, other states, like say, you have to name, uh, like if you have oats in your feed, you've got to call it oats. It can't be grain products. Um, I'll be real honest with you. Uh, I'm the manufacturer of Cool Speed horse feeds, and we use collective terms. Uh, I catch some flack about that, but 
anybody that wants to know, I'll tell them. But here's the big deal. Uh, there are very few, if any, secrets in the feed business. Everybody has the same access to the same ingredients. Uh, what we do is somewhat unique uh, with our blends, and that is the proprietary nature uh, of cool speed. And I just use collective terms because it's easy and I, I don't hide anything. It's just the way it is. Uh, we don't least cost our formulas. Least cost is when you change a formula daily, weekly, monthly, depending on what ingredients cost. Uh, uh, with cool speed and, and all of my feeds, uh, my philosophy is if, if it's good enough for you to put together and put your name on, don't be piddling with it. Uh, do it right the first time. And that's so maybe that, that's a little bit of a myth, like because I feel like people whenever they read on their proprietary blend or, um, you know, grain products or mm -hmm. forage products, they immediately think there's a bunch of fillers in there. <clears throat> exactly. And, and so that's where you've got to just reach out to the feed and make sure that. <clears throat> you know what's in it well and i'll tell you flat out feed companies have earned that reputation that that's no secret uh, a lot of times it's who can be a dime cheaper that gets a business uh, but my my philosophy is i want to be a dime higher and make you 20 cents and or be 30 cents better so that's that's just the way uh, I look at it, and, and our results pretty well bear out that philosophy is uh, translating in, translating into performance uh, in, in the horse industry. So, well, so then let's break into kind of to circle back a little bit to the therapy aspect of it. Um, your nutrition that's involved in healing, like whenever you've got injuries, and whenever we, or maybe we're trying to build top line, maybe we've got muscle atrophy that we're working against, or maybe that we've you know, ulcers, like mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on, you know, having your calorie content, having your nutrient content to meet the, meet the demand? Because well, I mean, I know like here we do before and after pictures of all of our horses and, mm -hmm. um, you know, a horse that's on a feed that doesn't have enough nutrients in it. Whenever I put that horse into hard work, they're going to just start to lose that muscle and I'm going to lose top line on them. And, you know, then at that point, I have to go back and, and reassess with the owner of like, hey, what you're feeding may not have the nutrient content to um, for this horse to be in this amount of work. We, we either need to up our feed or we need to change something or the harder I work this horse, the thinner he's going to get. Mm -hmm. Well, calorie intake versus calorie use obviously depends on how much work they're doing. Uh, the other thing that falls into that is some horses, your cow bred horses are just easier keepers mm -hmm. than, than your, your warm blood, thoroughbred type horses. So uh, you have to take all of those into account, but it's kind of like people, you're going to have different metabolisms. Exactly. Um, you exactly. know, your, your more sedentary horses are going to have um, less of a metabolism than your your high-end race horses um, or your your high-performing horses that maybe are going to be a little hotter and a little more fractious i mean honestly if you just have a horse standing out in the pasture and they're not doing anything uh, 10 to 12 percent protein in their total diet and, and just a a moderate level of calories they're going to stay fat stay in good shape now this is a horse that's not ancient or you know has good teeth there's some right. other factors there too but just kind of your normal middle-aged horse uh you know grass pretty much going to meet their requirements that a little bit of mineral and salt uh now if you ride two times a week you're going to have to feed some some concentrate of some kind a ex, uh, added calorie source now that can come from hay or it can come from a feed but uh Everybody has their own opinion of that, but obviously I have customers feeding uh, high quality alfalfa hay and three pounds of cool speed and their horses are fatter than toads. They look great. I have other people feeding free choice alfalfa hay. Uh, they and they ride their horses every day, exercise them and they're feeding 10 or 12 pounds of feed. Horses look great, but uh, to 
I hate to just put a number on it because right. everybody's situation is different and everybody has a difference of opinion of how they want their horse to look. Some of them are looking a little more racy, but here, here's, here's my opinion of that. I like a crease down a horse's back, muscle, not fat, but muscle. Uh, I want them to be lean, but I don't want them to be poor. You shouldn't be able to see a rib. Uh, obviously, if you're in the show horse industry, little fat is a very pretty color and it looks good. If you're well, it's also better muscle function too. So, yes. you know, as you strip away everything from those muscles to get that super lean racy look, um, a lot of times because we ride our horses longer periods of time than they're than the those horses are on the track, they've got to be able to have enough um padding in that muscle to be able to carry that saddle for a longer period of time. Yes. Otherwise you end up with horses that get really, really sore and they're taking a lot of that um impact on muscles that aren't quite uh nutrient based enough to be able to do the work right but, i mean you're looking at <clears throat> i'll just use protein i mean you're looking at at a requirement for a sedentary horse of 1.2 1.3 pounds of protein a day and that's crude protein a day uh all the way up to a horse needing you know three to four pounds of actual crude protein a day but it just depends on it's just like uh the way you drive your car, you drive around like grandma, not going to burn much fuel. You, <laughs> you drive like summer, it burns a lot of fuel. <laughs> I, I love that I just got called out so. that. He's not wrong. <laughs> um, um, well, then I'm going to circle back around to um, this question from Jennifer up here. Old retired show horses that are hard to keep weight on now, um, been turned out, wormed, dewormed, and fed at night. Um, so on a horse like that, is your fat more important than your protein? What what would be a well, potential solution for that situation? Once you meet a protein requirement, more doesn't do you any good. Okay. They just process it uh, and pee it out as, as ammonia. So <clears throat> calories is the big issue. Uh, but I'll tell you what I have seen in these old performance horses, whether show horses, race horses, whatever, uh, that have been retired a lot of times they will still have some gut issues left over from years ago and i honestly didn't think that could happen uh, until we actually scoped some horses that had been retired for a number of years and voila they had they still had an ulcer and, and that just shocked me because well I mean, they can also have scarring from yes. ulcers too if they were also very bad in their performance day. right but but that just tells me they don't just go away just because you have a horse retired. So uh, there again, I I would once again uh, go back to cool speed. That's what that's what we do. We fix the pH in the gut. Period. And uh, I've just seen some wonderful wonderful results on older horses, retired horses that uh, just couldn't keep weight on. Put them on cool speed and they blossom. Uh, so that just tells me. They had something going on in their gut that uh, wasn't being addressed. So no. then ideally, would you feed, um, you know, it, if you're going to feed more, um, like a, if you're going to feed a heavier amount to a hard keeper, would it be more beneficial to feed once a day or twice a day? Or what? what is the frequency on feeding grain? I know we talked about keeping hay in front of them, mm -hmm. but. I prefer to feed at least twice a day. Uh, the more you can spread that out, and keep the pH balance uh, level in that gut, uh, the better off you're going to be. You don't want your pH in the gut to be on a roller coaster. Uh, maybe a really, really easy one, but you don't want peaks and valleys, great big ones. That's, so, that's and, just a problem. Right, so in other words, if you're feeding a huge amount of feed once a day, the body's got to work that much harder to break that feed down and use it. And then you may pee out what they don't need versus feeding smaller portions along where the body is going to digest and be able to use that more thoroughly. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, a lot of that depends on the quality of the feed too. Uh, okay. The digestibility of the feed. Um, there again, I don't want to get into to poking at anybody's feed, but there are some products on the market that are highly, highly digestible. Some products on the market that are very indigestible. 
uh, and, I'll, and I'll use use one in particular, uh, the fiber source that we use in, in cool speed, which it's a fiber forage based feed. Yes, we do have a little bit of grain in it, but that's just to meet a, a small starch requirement for muscle function. Cool speed is primarily a fiber forage based feed. The fiber I use has slightly higher TDN than whole oats. Whole oats are a great feed, but they're very starchy. So what we so do- So what is TDN? I know I always have to back you up digestible on digestible nutrients. It's, it's just the <laughs> accumulation of the, uh, the nutrients that are uh, there for, to be utilized by the horse. So Getting our vocabulary in. There you go. Uh, so, and that's why that particular fiber, and here's, I'll go back to, to the tagging here in just a minute. That particular fiber is expensive uh, versus one that has the same fiber content that's very inexpensive, but the TDN of that is less than a third of the one I use. So there again, on the tagging end of it, that's I get pinged sometimes for, for having uh, roughage products on my tag. Well, that fiber source falls into roughage products, but so does the one that's very indigestible. And uh, there again, uh, the, the performance, what you see every day on cool speed, that's, that's the proof in the pudding. And that's, that's I know it works, but uh, mm. I hope I answered the question. So. Yeah, I think so. And, and like I said, I've got a couple more. We're going yeah, we to jump back up to for up sure. Too, so. Uh, yeah. So if you want to jump into any of these while you're while you're talking, um, if it. Uh, yes, uh, teeth. Yes, often forgotten. Jennifer Foxworth. Thank you for that. Uh, and what is your um, opinion on protein tubs? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> if if the teeth are bad, I don't care what you feed them. It's not going to be good. So get get the horse's teeth done. I mean, there's a lot of good uh, dental horse dentists around the country. So uh, for God's sake, get your teeth their horse's teeth done for sure so, because for one thing too if they don't if they're not able to chew correctly they're going to just swallow and that puts you at more of a risk of choke yes. and it also sends that feed down in in more clumps rather than actually broken up like you you would want it well and that's another stressor stressor mm -hmm. is what creates a, an acidic situation a lot of times too when mm -hmm. i found that those horses if they need their teeth done very bad they won't chew their hay yes. it, so they they stop they stop their consumption of hay. They it gets really really hard to get them to eat, and so then you end up with ulcers because you don't have that forage. Like circling back around to how important the forage is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they ask about tubs too. Uh, let me yeah, just protein comment tubs. on protein mm -hmm. tubs. Um, there are a lot of nutritionally balanced tubs on the market. Um, they they fill a void. They're very handy. Easy. You can put them out and let your horse go lick on them, and they'll they'll lick them when they want to, and it, it does help balance the diet. Um, tubs, in my opinion, fall into the uh, convenience category because if you're feeding a balanced feeding ration anyway, you shouldn't need a tub. Now, if it's a situation where you've got horses kicked out in the pasture somewhere, you know, uh, and you get off at five and it's dark at 5 30 and you don't have time to go feed sure put a tub out just make sure they have plenty of good quality hay with it and, and you'll get along uh, you're not going to make one fat on it unless your hay is extremely good but but there is a there's a place for tubs uh, some better than others I'm not going to call anybody out but uh, there is a place for them i my personal preference is is to balance the diet with feed and a good hay and make sure you have everything in those and then you don't you just don't need the tub but uh sure they're they're a viable product and if it fits your situation uh if you're going to be gone and need to know that your horse is getting something sure put a tub out nothing wrong with that so um so let's jump down to this question what are some signs of a horse receiving too much protein. Um, one that I can tell you is rock hard muscles. So there is a difference in a horse that, um, you know, looks really great and they're fit and they're, you know, beautiful and they're bloomed out. And like, you look at that horse and you go, that is an athlete. There, there is a big difference in that 
in a horse that has so much tension and lactic acid trapped in their muscles that they just can't move. They they look like that person that um, you know has spent their whole life lifting at the gym but can't run 10 foot in front of them. And so we see a lot of horses that get that, that are not able to process the amount of protein that is being run through their body that end up with tendon and ligament and soft tissue tears, muscle tears and things like that because whenever you are so tight and your lactic acid is not able to cycle through the body and you ask that horse to go to work, something is going to tear. We also see horses that tie up. Um, you know, that's one of the things like if you have a horse that is is not PSSM, there's not a genetic component to it, and you're, you're looking for uh, a reason maybe that horse tied up, I will usually go ahead and have blood work run to just make sure that you don't have too much protein, uh, that the horse can't actually uh, work work through it. And I don't know what else you see, but. Um, I wasn't aware of the lactic acid with the protein. I'll, I'll be honest with you. That, that's a, that, it happens in people too. Yeah. Uh, I always associated that more with starch than protein, but protein could act, be a factor of that. So, and, and that's where running your blood work, I think, would be beneficial yeah. because, um, like I said, sometimes you do get them that they simply can't break it down, and you'll find that on blood work. But some some symptoms. Well, let me make this point first. How much is too much protein? Honestly, if you're feeding a horse free choice alfalfa, that's 20% protein. They're eating 25 pounds a day. That's easy math. That's five pounds of protein a day. And I know a lot of people that do that. Mm -hmm. So how much is too much protein? Uh, if you go by NRC, that's way overfeeding protein. Uh, so, but that that just tells me that a horse has the ability to process a lot of that that extra uh, nitrogen and and pee it out through the mm -hmm. urine. Now, and and maybe there's also a factor that plays in, especially if you have one that ties up. We know tying up involves our kidneys, so maybe at some point your kidneys are not excreting the extra protein, and then you get the pile up. It, it may be one more than one thing, you know, not just one problem. I'm gonna I'm gonna defer that to a vet, <laughs> right? Uh, I, that I'm not gonna get into the physiology of that, but mm -hmm. um, my my point is, I I get this all the time. A horse can only process 12% protein. Okay, percents only tell you the concentration. They don't tell you how much you're getting unless you times that times the amounts being fed. So when somebody tells me they can only process 12% protein, I just got to say, then why in the world would you ever feed one straight alfalfa? Right. Why would you ever turn it out on, on wheat pasture or small grain pasture? You know, you ever see seen mares and colts on wheat pasture? The mares look great. They give lots of milk and the colts just bloom. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to confuse the issue, but how sure. much is, how much is too much protein? Uh, and like you said, then that's where you have to look at an individual. Um, and like I said, I had not really, that was not something that I would have thought at the forefront of my head, except for we have dealt with it here in the rehab. And when when some of these instances have come in with these muscle tears and things like that, and having that just super rock hard body, mm -hmm. um, it, it was just not a functional body. And so, you know, that's where we stepped to blood work. And those were some of the things that we found. But there may have been different circumstances as well. So uh, let's go to another question yes. here. Uh, Gabrielle, we have a super girthy mare. She had over issues and they have been removed, hoping that would have fixed the issue as well. Had her scope, but no ulcer found in the stomach. I am thinking hindgut ulcer and not learned behavior like I have been told. Uh, what kind of feeder to see that would change the behavior? There again, I'm not a vet, I'm not going to jump off into uh, into that realm. Uh, if you scope and there's no ulcers, it could be the precursor. I mean, she could have the equivalent of me and you having heartburn and not not a full blown ulcer. Uh, you mentioned hindgut ulcers. There again, uh, I'm going to defer to vets on them. I've talked to a number of vets. Some say, yeah, they're a thing. Some vets say prove that they're a thing. So. There again, 
if you have a an acidic foregut, my opinion is you're going to have an acidic hindgut, and the chances are, uh, if you don't have hindgut ulcers per se, there again you have that that burning in the in the gut and that uncomfortable the girthiness, irrita irritation that sort of thing. So, um, don't know that I can answer that definitively. Uh, just some things sure. to think about. Well, and, and from a body work therapy standpoint, um, you know, knowing that that horse had ovary issues, a lot of times you can have um, issues that radiate forward, like working with your um, anterior pec muscles, your posterior pec muscles, your thoracic sling. There can be a body work component to that um, that's an overcompensation pattern for having the painful ovaries that, um, you know, maybe it, it could also be a body work issue and a mechanical issue versus the actual stomach. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's one of those things that's just hard to know without seeing that horse. Um, and then to go back to the follow up, once they once they reach the point on the on the too much protein, um, like I said, we we found those cases through a vet through through veterinary blood work. Um, you know, one of the horses uh, was put on lactinase. Like there there was some there was veterinary intervention. Um, so if you've got a question on that, blood work is to me, blood work is something that should be routine anyway, because that way, you know, where you're at before you get into trouble. Like if you don't know what's normal for your horse, because you've never done any routine blood work on them. Um, and then you get to a point that's a situation or a problem, you don't have any base point. So, um, I'm kind of an advocate for doing blood work at least twice a year anyway. Uh, because you're, especially on a horse you're performing on, because they go through so much, so many changes. Um, you know, it's like we're saying, if the if the system is working properly, um, the body should get rid and eliminate what it doesn't need. But if something's not working properly, then you start to get an imbalance. And so I'm going to jump back up here um, and and let you kind of run through the breakdown of what's in cool speed and your development process with it and then i'm going to jump back to uh, this question up here okay. so that question right there real okay. quick because uh, i get that a lot um because of the formulation of cool speed there uh, and, are and this is going back sorry this is going back to the question about leaving the crumbles in the bucket that the that you are feeding the cool speed yeah we, we didn't go back to read it uh, sorry <laughs> starlin uh, this is to answer your question about uh, you just started Noticed your mare was eating everything, but uh, some of the fines in the bottom of the bucket. Um, I wish I could tell you I could fix that and it'd never happen again, but that's not gonna happen either. So uh, I just had a lengthy conversation uh, with a lady uh, on actually on my way up here to do this with Summer. Uh, two horses uh, eating everything in the bucket, licking it. One of them leaving some fines, maybe a handful at the end. Uh, that's horse preference. Uh, just they're just like us. Uh, uh, what I have noticed uh, in the eight years since we we developed Cool Speed and put it on the market is that if a horse leaves a few finds in the bottom, I mean even a a, a big handful, it has not affected the performance uh, of the horse. Uh, and the pH balancing characteristics of the feed. Uh, I have not noticed any pattern whatsoever uh, of, now obviously there's gonna be some vitamins, some minerals, some trace minerals uh, in the, those finds, but them leaving those in the bottom of the bucket uh, to me is more of an aggravation than it is a, a problem as far as performance of the feed. So hope that answered your question. Well, so let's let's go to what makes cool speed what it is. OK, uh, cool speed started out being a really cool idea. No pun intended. Uh, a customer of mine that I had sold feed to for a number of years in the cutting horse industry uh, uh, came in and was telling me how bad his horses were with ulcers. And I thought, OK, I can fix this. So that's how it started. Uh, formulated the first batch of cool speed and uh, uh, gave some to Donna K. Rule and I said, Donna K., I need a, a really, really black and white opinion about what we're doing here. Fixed her horse uh, and uh, 
it's been a pretty fun ride ever since then. So, but I, I developed it specifically for fixing pH in the gut. Uh, we don't heal ulcers. We don't cure ulcers. What we do is create an environment to where they just can't exist. And basically that is a balanced pH with a high fiber content, very highly digestible fiber content, forage based feed, low starch, high fat. I mean, we, we clicked all the buttons that uh, you hear about every day as far as, as feeds go. But there are some proprietary things that I do, some conventional and non-conventional products that I use uh to achieve the the perfect ph balance and then hold it there whether you're riding your horse two days a week or seven days a week uh it it has just worked uh and very briefly after the first trial or two that i ran with it and we got some fabulous results i started scoping horses and for two years that's all i did i didn't put a tag on it i didn't put my name on it um uh, People were coming in and asking for it just because word was getting out. I'm not going to tell you I didn't sell some of it, uh, but I never put my name on it and really promoted it till we had scoped, I don't know, probably 20 horses. Uh, when I say scope them, we scope them, feed them 30 days, rescope them just to document. Uh, and to date, we've scoped over 50 and we have never failed. I mean, it has worked 100% of the time. And when I say it's worked 100% of the time, uh, the ulcers just disappear. Like I said, we don't heal, we don't cure. We just create an environment where they just pretty much can't exist. And uh, once you get rid of them, it's easy to maintain. And you can maintain on a, on a, a lesser amount of feed. During all the trials, we fed 10 to 12 pounds per head per day. And that's a lot of feed, I know. But that's what we felt and that's how I formulated it uh, for that pH balance. But uh, once once you get past that 30 days, depending on the type of hay you're feeding, you know, we have customers in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, feeding the very best alfalfa. And, uh, you know, their horses will maintain on three, four pounds of feed a day. Um, if you're feeding straight grass hay, and live in Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Arkansas, Louisiana, you know, kind of in, in our home area, our grasses aren't as good. We have to import the good hay. So generally five to seven pounds uh, for maintenance. And that's there again, maintenance, part of that maintenance is, is body condition, where you feel like your horse is, runs the best, performs the best, looks the best, and what your opinion is. So uh, we have a lot of people that talk about, you know, like I tend to feed a little heavier here in the therapy barn, but mm -hmm. um, we're working with a lot of injuries. We're working on healing. I'm working on, you know, muscle atrophy. I'm working, trying to build these horses mm -hmm. back. So uh, most times when I have a horse come in, I have a little bit of an uphill battle against me anyway. So I want to make sure that my nutrients are um, meeting, meeting the needs of my horse, uh, because I may have a horse that comes in with three or four problems. And then you have the horses that come in that are just, you know, here for fitness and conditioning and just to get in shape. And um, I can back that feed off. I don't have to feed it them near as much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we I'll, work I'll, with a lot of ulcers, you know, right. obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Summer has, has been a customer since the beginning. Uh, she has been with me. She, she, uh, started feeding cool speed when I first came out with it and has been a customer ever since. Uh, and it has really been a, a great place to showcase what we can do since she uh, started superior therapy, because you can bet when she gets a horse, it's stressed, having issues mm -hmm. recuperating, uh, it needs all the help it can get. So, and, it, and it's been, uh, been working fabulously here for summer, but, uh, uh, there are lots of good feeds on the market. There are nutritionally sound. And what I want to say about cool speed is it. Yes, we do. We do fix gut pH and and get it exactly like God made him. But you don't have to have a problem horse to feed cool speed. Uh, it can also be a 
preventative for, for gut issues just because you keep that pH right. And where we, see, we have seen a, a, a really good market develop is in the, the Marin foal market. Uh, you know, they're not stressed, they're sitting down in the pasture. But you, you feed the cool foal product to your babies and your mares and the cool foal, I call it cool foal, but it'll make, meet the requirements of a lactating mare also. But you feed that to them, your mare is in high gear when it's time to rebreed, number one. Number two, you're not gonna have leg issues when that baby's born. Number two, three, that baby is gonna develop up to its genetic potential. And, and a, a vet told me one time when we, I was asking him about, you know, what he saw uh, with horses guts and whatnot. He, and he said, he said, think about it. He said, what's the first stressor for every horse? The very first stressor, weaning time. He said, in my opinion, that's where a lot of the acidity, acidity and gut issues start if it's not addressed. And, and that's honestly, that's what prompted me to make a, a Marin Foal version of the cool speed uh, with all the pH balancing characteristics. Uh, well, then also I had bought a couple mares uh, sight and seen that were bred and got them in. And of course, nutrition was not there. They didn't match the picture. You know, same, same old story that, that we've all encountered once or twice. But whenever those babies were born, um, I was starting to have some epiphysitis and remember I had the bigger mm -hmm, ankles. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that might be something to touch on too, is, is things that we see when there is a developmental issue. Mm -hmm. Well, generally speaking, uh, if there's a developmental issue, it, it, it goes back to nutrition and that nutrition starts when that mare is bred, not, <laughs> yeah. not, not too much before the baby. she falls. <laughs> yeah. It starts when that mare is bred because, uh, that foal is going to be a, a mirror image of the nutrient profile of that mare. So you need to keep her on a high level of nutrition all the way up the time she foals. And remember, remember, when she foals, her nutrient requirements pretty much double. So and then if you breed back on foal heat, then yep. you know, now you're feeding a package. Yes, you're feeding a three in one. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. You can't like the old timers used to say, just kick them out and let them be a mare. Well, that was all well and good, but we have bred so much performance into these horses and bred out some thriftiness and bred in some, some maintenance issues maybe that uh, we have to address them. Well, and so, I think another thing too is the fact that our pastures are not as nutrient. You know, if you graze the same pasture all the time, you know, as our earth is kind of depleted, you know, our nutrient levels in the ground change. Unless, unless you're replacing them with, mm -hmm. with, a, with fertilizer, then yes. Now, <clears throat> so the earth was more nutrient balance or uh, there was more nutrients in the soil 30 years ago than what there are going to be today. If you're cutting hay, that is really true. If you're grazing animals on it and their, their droppings are on it, they're play, they're putting some of that back, not all of it, because mm -hmm. obviously they have to use some of it. So, uh, uh, just a, a grass clippings test will tell you everything you need to know about your, your pasture, but, right. but overgrazing is pretty rampant. I mean, yeah, everybody I, does it. Mm -hmm. So, especially you got a small place and lots of horses. So, uh, anyway, I won't belabor that point, but, uh, let's go to another question here. Um, yeah, Elaine, uh, has a horse with Lyme disease, trying to stay ahead of it, keep her healthy. Seems like full-time job uh, to keep her running. Uh, have experience with horses with uh, like that, and I had to treat her for ulcers as well. <clears throat> Typically, I've had good luck with um, using the cool speed for like our Limes and EPM horses. Um, of course, if, you, if any of y'all follow us, you know that we <laughs> tend tend to be EPM central around here. We and we get them from multiple states coming in um, for our rehab that we do for these horses. And if I have a horse that still is testing hot on their ulcer points and this horse has been on the cool speed, you know, more than about 14 days, I, I'm usually looking for another issue of, okay, maybe we have got pain that we're just not able to get that gut balance because the horse is in too much pain, or do I need to treat for EPM? Do I need to, I, I'm, I'm starting to look for 
something that is fueling that gut fire outside of just what I'm feeding. So I, I've had really, really good success with it. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, if I, if I can't calm the stomach with the feed, um, I'm, I'm hunting something else that's setting it off. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Very good point, Tony. So um, I'm just about out of gas. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> uh there i know there's more questions here yeah there's uh, a lot of questions about dealers um i know there's a dealer locator on the website i've posted it um yeah i feel like um this has been we, good yeah we're, we're gaining dealers all the time um unfortunately you know oklahoma and texas are is kind of our home territory we're expanding into Arkansas. Uh, just put two new dealers on over there in the last two weeks, and uh, New Mexico and Arizona. You know, we're we're adding dealers. Seem like a, you know one ever just every week or so. How many um, states are you in now? Uh, manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, obviously, uh, our main manufacturing plant in Mansell, Oklahoma. We also have a plant in Bainbridge, Georgia. Uh, Flint River Mills. You can actually go on their website and find their dealer locator, and uh, they're they're a licensed manufacturer of Cool Speed, and we have a, a mill, L.A. Hearn Company in King City, California, uh, that's also a licensed manufacturer. So uh, with COVID and everything, uh, we haven't got to, got to, out to really push very hard for those other manufacturers, but it is available in their trade area. Uh, I just uh, also have a, a manufacturer in uh, Minnesota, not too far from the racetrack. I can't think of the name of the town, but the mill is uh, Flegel Mill and Elevator. And mm. uh, they're gonna be covering uh, the Minnesota area. Uh, we're actually doing some trials in Maryland and South Florida on some horses as we speak, some uh, hunter jumper uh, horses. Mm. So. Well, and I know um, one of our bigger cutter um, cutting clients, when she sent her horses last time, she said, I just switched to the cool speed at my trainer. And she said, we love it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, you know, what all disciplines, obviously we know Donna K. Rule in the, in the barrel industry mm-hmm. and, but, but you've had success with race horses and. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you talk about a horse's pH balance and, and gut health, a horse is a horse is a horse. I mean, <laughs> Uh, warm bloods aren't made any different uh, than a than a cold. I mean a cold blooded horse. So uh, I get I get there are some subtle differences. Uh, some of them are easier keepers. Some of them are harder keepers. But a horse is a horse is a horse when it comes to that digestive tract. So it doesn't matter what discipline you're in. Um, I, I have discovered in different disciplines there are opinions of how to feed horses uh, and when to feed them, what to feed them. And, you know, this will work or this won't work. Uh, but those are personal preferences and uh, that's my opinion. Uh, good feed is good feed, good hay is good hay, good feeding management is good feeding management. Yes. Don't care who you are. Uh, and I'm going to jump back to Layla's question here. You know, would you say if you could keep ulcers down or better yet away, you'd be able to prevent things like EPM and other things that ail horses. So, you know, that's one of the things that Dr. Sam Crosby has talked about a lot in his lives is, you know, they are starting to prove that there is a component to leaky gut um, with, with the, especially the uh, relapse of EPM and things like that. So, you know, yes, if we can balance the gut, the body, whether it's horse or human or, or anything, it, it, gut balance is everything. You know, when you start to have um, leaky gut, you start to have ulcers, you start to have an acidic environment. Um, yeah, it's going to diminish the immune system. It diminishes. I, I mean, that's one of the first signs of ulcers. Maybe not the first sign, but that's one of the um, easiest to detect signs of an ulcery horse is that dull, brittle hair coat. You know, those horses just don't have a shine to them. They just look like they don't feel well. They they literally look like their gut has burnt the coat off of them. And so that's where dull. you get that dull, dry looking coat. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, I think one of the secrets to success is having a healthy gut. That's a really good question from Layla. 
Uh, would you say oh, that, that? I think that was the one I just yeah. conquered. Oh, really? <laughs> sorry. Keep the ulcers down with uh, EPM. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I was reading, I was reading that, not That's paying okay. attention to what you were saying. Just because you eliminate ulcers does not mean that your horse won't get EPM. Those are complete separate issues. Uh, I mean, EPM mm -hmm. is an organism. So uh, that's going to come from. But like I said, they are, they have done research. They're starting to prove the research that if there's leaky gut there, the mm -hmm. chance of relapse is higher. Yes, so, you yes. know, I, I think it goes back to the um, if you have a balanced gut, your horse may have more chance of fighting off that protozoa versus an unhealthy system. Yes, we have actually had really good results with recovering horses, you know, after they've taken treatments, getting them back on their feet, getting them healthy and, and because the, the immune system starts in the gut. Mm -hmm. And if you have a healthy gut, you're going to have a healthy immune system. They're going to be able to fight off some of those challenges that they couldn't if they if they just didn't have a, a healthy digestive tract and, and getting a good nutrient dense diet. So. So before we sign off here, do you want to kind of tell the difference in the formula? So you have sure. the cool speed collection, which is what we feed, and then all the way down to the original. Uh, the original cool speed is a 14 protein, 6% fat. Uh, then the cool speed plus is a 14 protein, 8% fat. And the two points of fat is the only difference between them. They're identical formulas other than the two points of fat. Uh, we developed the collection version actually for a, uh, a dressage stable years ago. Uh, they wanted uh, extra shine to the coat, so we put some extra omega threes in, used flaxseed meal, and also some extra bulk, so we put some uh, beet pulp in it. So, the and it's an eight and a half fat, fourteen protein. The the collection when you look at them, a handful of each one of them. Uh, they're kind of hard to tell apart because they're very, very similar formulations. They're just subtle differences to meet, you know, a difference uh, of activity level or someone's preference. Um, the collection, I will have to say, when I first put it together, I, I was a little skeptical that, that it really would make much difference. Uh, but over time, I've seen horses that were fed Cool speed regular or cool speed plus mm -hmm. switch to the collection, and there is a difference. Uh, well, it, I, and I so, fed I fed a little bit of all of them. Yeah, so the collection's yeah. always my go-to. Summer has been through the whole gamut at one point, <laughs> uh, and she has stuck on the collection. So, yeah. um, but if if you're not riding your horse good, you don't need that extra fat or hard. I mean, you don't need that extra fat. So, right. feed the regular cool speed. You're still going to get the pH balance. Still going to have a healthy horse. Uh, you just don't have the extra calories the horse that's really being ridden hard needs. So, uh, and there again, the cool foal I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's a, it's a, I call it cool foal, but it, it will meet the requirements of a lactating mare. And uh, I do want to put one plug in for another product that's not in the cool speed line, but it's called Pro Mare. Um, I answered a question earlier about tubs. It's the same philosophy as a tub but it's just a loose meal. Um, you put it out in the tub when it gets empty that you bought. Uh, and here's my reasoning for that. <clears throat> if you're buying a tub, you're paying somebody a whole lot of money for processing and that tub. The, the Promare is a meal. It's the same philosophy as a tub, but you just don't have all that expense. And it's super fortified. You'll love the way your mares and colts look on it but you just put it out free choice. It's a third salt, so they can't overeat. They'll, they'll come by and hit it three, four, five times a day, go get them a drink, go eat hay, and just cycle back around. The cool thing about that product is, if you've ever fed a band of mares in tubs, what's the first thing that happens? You're running down through there putting feet out and you got a squealing, kicking mare running everybody else off. You will never have another mare fight with pro mare and all the requirements from requirements will be met, but it's just like no drama, no drama in the mare pasture. So I like it. Pro mare. Yeah. Well thank you for coming on and doing this live. Um 
So uh, I posted the website above coolspeed.com and that's cool with a K. Uh, you can also find like the Facebook is um, cool speed equine performance feed. And so you can take all your questions there. There's a lot of before and afters. Um, I feel like you have a really interactive community. I, I feel yeah. like you have a lot of people that are posting uh, pictures of their horses and before and afters and ulcer uh, results. And yeah. it, there's a lot of great information to go mm -hmm. on there and read. And Good news travels fast. Uh, I do want to make one point. Cool speed does not have salt in it. So keep a, a, a source of salt out at all times. Free choice. Don't hand feed it. Don't force feed it. Keep it out free choice where they can just lick it when they need it. Uh, it's an essential uh, nutrient that I do not put in cool speed because I want it. I don't want to force feed it. I want a mm -hmm. horse to eat it as they need it, and they will. So do they need to top dress with anything like probiotics or? It no, we have them in there already. Uh, probiotics and prebiotics. We actually use a product uh, called Amifirm uh, that uh, is in our supplement that we put in Cool Speed, and, and it covers all those bases. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for tuning in. Happy trails, y'all. Adios.